I want to talk to you about information. Instinctively, we think we know what it is, and so we should. We're surrounded by it. Smartphones, social media, TV, advertising, even the fact that I'm talking to you and you might want to talk to me. At that level, the idea of information is very familiar to us. We just literally get it, right? But I don't want to talk to you about that at all. I want to talk to you about something far deeper, something much more powerful. I want to talk about the idea that information might be essential to everything. And I literally mean everything. The idea that information might even be a foundational element of the universe itself. Now that's a big claim, that's a really big claim. How can I even go there? Well actually, I can. Because it's possible to think of the universe as just being one vast information processing engine. It takes in information over time and it transforms it into, well, whatever this thing around us is, we choose to call reality. But that presents us with a really clear problem. Because even though the idea of information touches everything that we know and experience, even today, no matter where you look or how hard you try, you'll still not find a universally accepted definition of what information is. Now, I think we should care about that. I think we should properly care about that. Because even though individual fields of human endeavor have grown increasingly comfortable with their own interpretations of information, how can we, that's you, and you, and certainly me, how can we claim to know anything about anything if we don't have that one clear, shared understanding of that one thing that flows through everything? Wow! For me, that problem is both overwhelmingly obvious and yet mind-bendingly difficult to come to terms with. Yet even though philosophers and scientists have struggled with the idea of information down the ages, the story doesn't stop there. There's no full stop at the end of that sentence, because a lot of progress has been made. As one example, today we've now come to realize that the difference between things like cups and saucers, tables and chairs, apples or pears, may not actually be down to the things themselves, but rather the individual viewpoints from which they're being observed. So what I thought I'd like to do is take you all on a bit of a journey from a scientific perspective. It's a journey of eight steps. And by the end of it, hopefully, I'll be pointing you at least in the right direction of one plausible, if not sensible, definition of information. Now, as I take you on that journey, I'm going to have to set the scene a bit, and admittedly, I'll apologize up front, I'm going to have to simplify things slightly, but please, stay with it, because by the end of step six, some real magic's going to kick in to help round things off. Okay, so are we ready? Yeah. Let's go then. Step one, complexity is hopefully obvious in that eventually we realize that the world around us is actually a complex thing. Now, most of us will only make sense of the world or see the, sense the world as making sense when it's framed by something that matters to us. Now, that's the important things in life, like family, friends, or perhaps even work. But it is possible to make sense of the world by thinking in terms of connections. That's one thing connected to another, either by physical attachment, association over time, or simply overlap of definition or understanding. In the end, it probably comes down to something we've known all along. Reality is nothing more than a complex tapestry of everything. But that presents another problem, because the very limits of the human brain lead us to absolutely hate complexity, when complexity gets to a certain level, we just literally switch out. So that brings us to step two, because fortunately we've managed to find some ways to cut through some of that complexity to find some simplicity. This is where hardcore science has come in really handy, by discovering time and time again that the universe is willing to talk to us in shorthand. The evidence is out there, we see it in the equations of science, like E equals MC squared, 
which are basically just summaries of huge quantities of data distilled and organized using the language of math so we can understand them properly. Now, equations are fine, equations are great, but in certain circumstances, they're not the best. So that takes us to step three, patterns, which points out that fortunately we found other ways to describe the world. One of those is using advances in modern computers to simply go looking for patterns out there in all that data. And the use of patterns not only appeals to the way that we naturally see the world, but importantly, it's helping us get to grips with certain types of complexity. That moves us on to step four, networks. And that simply acknowledges the fact that we've started to recognize important types of pattern. Now, one of those isn't a million miles away from the good old 80-20 rule that you're probably already familiar with. So just let me refresh your memory. The 80-20 rule tells us of situations where the majority of the effect is generated by a surprisingly small amount of the input used to create it. And that's why the 80-20 rule kind of explains why at any one time, there's only a very, very small number of big spenders in the world, or famous film stars, or for that matter, as you've probably noticed, popular people at a party. We've all been there, right? Certainly I have that, but I hear you, sister. Right. <laughs> they form the focus of attention, and most of the other party goers there will congregate around them in close proximity. Now, if you wanted to draw that type of arrangement, you'd create a network, not unlike the one you see behind me. Now, that type of formation is known as being scale-free. So we've created a scale-free network. And in certain circumstances, it just turns out that scale-free networks are remarkably similar to the 80-20 rule, only in pattern form this time. Now that takes us on to step five, commonplace. And this is where the magic kind of starts to kick in. Because it turns out that scale freeness is remarkably commonplace and varied. If you look across nature, you'll see scale free networks. For example, in certain types of chemical network or the organic evolution of plants, perhaps. But you would think that scale free networks or scale freeness would have absolutely no right at all to exist in man made systems. But here's the thing if you were to examine the way that websites connect, for example, or the way that cities grow, or the way that consensus flows across a social network, then the likelihood is that scale freeness will still be relatively close by. And the reason for that is that scale freeness appears to minimize the amount of communication effort needed in networks. And it does that by channeling the information present through a limited number of concentration points or hubs. These aren't unlike the uh, railway stations we might see in any big city, such as Hong Kong, Rome, London, or San Francisco, right? Yeah. Interestingly as well, the example that I really like is that you can find scale freeness in the trunk of a tree where branches meet roots. That nicely appeals to me, yeah? So scale freeness firstly helps the flow of information across the network, and more importantly, it also apparently helps to keep networks efficient no matter how large or complex they might grow. Now I'll come back to why that's important at the end of step seven. But for now, let me focus back on the idea of information. And that brings us to step six, not data. Because even though we may not understand the idea of information properly today, we do understand the idea of data really well. Today, we recognize it as, now stay with me, because at this point, I've got to read from the textbook, because this bit's tricky. Micro parcels of meaning delivered using symbols of numbers or letters. Phew. Right. Thanks for that, because that was a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> right. However, back in the room, those systems of symbols are basically just like the equations of maths or science, shorthand that we have jointly agreed. Yeah. We also know that, the, that value can be added by increasing the amount of structure present. So for example, if we were to take a string of eight digits and intersperse it with two slashes, 
then sometimes we might transform what we would originally recognize as a number into something that would be much more familiar to us as a date. But it's only when context is added and data plus structure is linked to other constructs like names or places that information is truly formed and we come to understand that what we actually might have is somebody's date of birth. Context therefore brings data to life. It makes the concepts contained within feel real to us. It anchors them into our world. Now that brings me to step seven, context, which basically just highlights the importance of both context and networks in the formation of information. After all, what would reality be without at least an appreciation of the connected nature of everything around and within us? And that's why when geeks like me think of science and its underlying math, we actually think of the story of information. Now here it is, here's the takeaway point. And for me, that makes information truly the most fundamental of fundamental things. The magic ingredient in all of this is context. It adds that one thing special. It allows us to draw meaning from the world. Now that might seem like a bit of a leap, so I'm gonna take a liberty. Just let me explain a little bit further. In many ways, context can be thought of as a kind of container marking out the importance or purpose of the information contained within. It therefore pulls together a number of storylines, but it also stops those storylines from spiraling out of control. Now, in many ways, that means that context can be thought of as both the scissors and the glue we use to create our individual viewpoints on the world, as storylines converge, diverge, and emerge. They provide our individual take on the world as we interact with, and I need to get the textbook out again, I'm sorry, as we interact with the universal network of meaning. And this is where scale-free networks come back in, because scale-free networks apparently allow us to absorb the relevancies contained no matter how large or complex they might be. In essence, they're copy mechanisms to allow us to interact with reality. And that brings us to our final step, convergence. And this is where the magic really, really starts to emanate out. The terms universal and network are not a play on words. I'm using them exceptionally deliberately because not only do they remind us that our minds make sense of the world by creating complex maps or networks of understanding, but they also point to an alignment with some really, really fundamental science. So networks, all networks, are basically just a form of geometry. And that's an expansion on the really simple idea of connecting or making links, drawing links between one thing and another. Now here's the thing. Einstein, for one, lent very heavily on the idea of geometry when he explained to us the way the world works as a whole. Quantum physicists also rely on geometry, although admittedly they use it in different ways, and this time to explain the world at minute levels of detail. But nevertheless, both still use geometry to pull together their ideas to create important world views. But neither can yet present a perfect picture of the world. And it's precisely for reasons like that that the ideas of information and networks are coming into the spotlight. By doing so, they're pulling together traditional thinking with more contemporary ideas on complexity to hopefully, and I mean fingers crossed, fill some important gaps in our understanding. Right, so having been on this journey, might it be possible to return to the original question posed and answer what is information? So at this point, stand back, because I'm about to jump off the cliff. <laughs> right. I'm foolishly going to try by suggesting that perhaps it is our regulated interaction with the network of existence that is our universe. Now, hands up. I know to some that might still sound really complicated, but actually it's not. Actually, it's super simple. In fact, it's so simple, it's almost poetic. What it's actually telling us is that if and when we finally do find an explanation for everything out there, 
the bit that links everything together will be really important. The piece of the jigsaw we're still missing is the piece that links our experiences of the world with the world itself. And that, for me, is the very essence of information. Every last bit of it. When we do get that clear, shared understanding of information, surely it'll give us some additional insight into the who, where, when, and what the universe is. And perhaps, please, perhaps, it might even give us a tantalizing glimpse into the answer to what has to be the biggest question of all. And that has to be, why is the universe there in the first place? And why the hell are we in it? Thank you for joining me on this journey.